Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Josh Gordon. Uh, we're thrilled to have Josh with us uh, from the standpoint of not only the science that he's going to be talking about, but also from the standpoint of his role as being director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And hopefully we'll, we'll get an, a chance to interact with Josh around not only the science, but also some policy issues that are, are relevant and some of the things that we heard about already and some of the questions and answers. Um, Josh uh, did his uh, MD work and PhD work at uh, San Francisco and then moved to Columbia where he did a postdoctoral fellowship and was on the faculty there. And then in 2016, um, joined, went to Washington and took over the role as the director of NIMH, which uh, is no small job, I'm sure. And uh, during, in addition to that, during this COVID period, I'm sure has been very, very challenging in many ways as well, especially in relation to the upcoming, the current and upcoming increase in mental mental illness and problems that we're going to be seeing. Um, it's uh, exciting to have you here, Josh. As, as Richie has mentioned, if you want to get more about Josh's biography, you can go on the website. Uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing from you and don't want to take up any more of your time. So thank you for taking the time to be with us and we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thanks, Ned. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here and thanks to everyone for joining me today. I'm actually going to try to give you a little bit of a little bit of uh, science today and also a little bit of policy uh, to bring it around. And um, and hopefully you'll see how those two things fit together. Uh, so the first I'm going to talk about work from from my own lab, um, uh, some of which was published as recently as last year. Uh, we, I continue to have a lab here at, at NIH, although I moved away from emotion and focused more on working memory. And I thought that that's probably what you'd want to hear about the emotional stuff. Although now I realize I probably could have talked about working memory too, given uh, given David's talk, it would have been uh, fit in nicely. So let's start there. And uh, really, what what my work on uh, in the lab has has been about over the years is trying to understand the role of neural dynamics in producing behavior of uh, of various sorts. And of course, I'm going to be talking about avoidance behavior today, which may or may not be relevant to anxiety. But the the, the questions that we ask are really about how is information transmitted from one brain region to the other? And uh, and does that how really matter in that uh, causal or C way uh, that David introduced earlier? So uh, we're going to talk about uh, a relatively simple, straightforward avoidance behavior in rodents, uh, in the elevated plus maze. Many of you are familiar with it. Um, and we've been studying it for a number of years, ever since a grad student in my lab, Bob Shekhatakari, did the original work. He was my first student uh, in uh, in 2010. And we've been studying in particular activity in two brain regions that others had shown to be crucial for avoidance behavior in the plus maze. So the plus maze, just so you know, has two open arms, two closed arms, and rodents will naturally avoid the open parts of the maze and, uh, and spend most of their time in the closed parts of the maze. And various drugs which manipulate ang anxiety have, have expected effects in, the, in this test. Uh, in, in this behavior, and um, so and, and physiological manifestations of anxiety and stress can be demonstrated when the animals are in this maze. Uh, but really what we're going to be talking about today is less a story about uh, emotional behavior per se, and more a story on how uh, interaction between brain regions generate that behavior. So again, we have these two structures, lesions and manipulations of which have been shown to, to change behavior in the maze. And we were really interested in understanding the nuts and bolts about how neuronal activity in these two brain regions uh, allow the animal uh, to avoid the open parts of the maze. Uh, and one of the first things that we did is, is borrowing from really pioneers in the field of, of looking at neural dynamics and communication between brain regions and primarily work out of Matt Wilson's lab was to study the temporal dynamics of uh, hippocampal and pre prefrontal cortical activity and ask how they work how they uh, work together in t over time. To do that, we placed electrodes in both uh, brain regions, recorded neural activity at the same time. In the hippocampus, we reported the local field potential, which is kind of like an EEG. It, uh, it sums up the activity uh, from many, many synapses probably in the vicinity of the electrode over time. And what you can see over time in a rodent is uh, that this activity goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And there's different frequency components. There's fast stuff fast little squiggles here that's that's roughly about 40 times a second up and down that's the gamma frequency and then there's a slower pattern illustrated here by the dashed purple line that's uh, happening around eight times a second in a rodent that's the theta frequency oscillation there's your scale bar to show that i'm not making it up 
Um, and then we can record simultaneously neural activity in the, in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, we do that uh, by with our electrode in the prefrontal cortex recording. We can record LFP, but for today, I'm just going to show you activity from multiple single neurons within that prefrontal cortex. And what you can see at first glance is that, uh, at least for some of these neurons, the action potentials here illustrated by these uh, dashed the, these lines, the action potentials tend to fire at particular parts of the up and down oscillation in the hippocampus. And if we quantify that uh, for one neuron, you can see that again, one neuron, many hundreds of spikes accumulated. Most of those spikes or more of the spikes tend to occur at the peak of the theta frequency oscillation in this case. Uh, um, so this is a medial prefrontal cortical neuron that seems to be lining up to an oscillation that's occurring in the hippocampus. And on average, according from say 90 neurons in this experiment by a postdoc who was in the lab at the time, Torfi, Torfi Sigurdsson, uh, that about 60% of those neurons will be uh, lining up in time with the hippocampal theta oscillation. We, we term this phase locking. So I'm going to use phase locking as shorthand for saying that a, that a, a given neuron uh, tends to fire in, in rhythm with the oscillation in the hippocampus. Now, um, one of the things that we were interested in knowing is whether that uh, lockstep uh, timing might signal the fact that information is, is being sent from one brain, brain region to the other. And I won't show you data, but we had lots of, of evidence to suppose, as do, did others, that that information was being sent from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. I'll get into some causal data to suggest that in a moment. But before that, we wanted to understand if information is being sent to the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, what kind of information is being represented. Uh, one possibility was suggested by this experiment that Avishek did, which is record uh, these neurons both in, in, a, in a control environment, and these, the data in black are from a control environment, a small in, uh, enclosed arena that the animal is exposed to over and over again, a so-called familiar box, um, and then recording from the same neuron uh, in a different condition placed in the elevated plus maze. So what you can see is that uh, just merely placing the animal in the, uh, in the elevated plus maze increased the strength of phase locking for this particular neuron. So uh, an even unphased lock neuron would be flat all the way across. You can see that this neuron tended to fire uh, in this particular phase of the hippocampal theta oscillation, and that tendency was stronger when the animal was placed in the plus maze. And we can quantify that with a statistic called the mean resultant length in this case, and that MRL is increased. And indeed, what Avi showed is that uh, when you do that uh, uh, for uh, a lot of neurons, when, uh, you find that on average, most neurons increase their phase locking uh, in this elevated plus phase environment. So that's one piece of it. It seems like this phase locking, which may be a, a proxy for information flow, is increased when the animal is placed in this elevated plus phase environment, consistent with the notion that that information flow may be used by the animal to guide behavior. Uh, another indication in the same experiment was uh, to look at the information that the medial prefrontal cortical neurons are actually uh, are actually representing uh, when the animal's in the plus maze. And Avi showed that, again, on average, many neurons, if not most neurons in the prefrontal cortex, tend to uh, represent the spatial structure of the plus maze. And not just like uh, the general spatial structure, like in the hippocampus, where you, in the, where you have these place fields, well-defined spots, but actually the um, task relevant spatial structure. So uh, Avi showed that most neurons fired either in the closed arms or in the open arms of the maze. A few neurons tended to fire in the center of the maze. That is, they didn't just represent uh, like a, a pixel wise map, they represented the structure of the maze that was behaviorally relevant to the animals. Uh, and, and furthermore, he went on to show, uh, again, data I don't have time to show you, that the, that uh, the neurons that most strongly represented the open versus closed structure of the maze were also the same neurons that were most strongly phase locked to the hippocampal theta oscillation, supporting the notion that this information structure was set up by that putative information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. So that was the state of the matter when we first started exploring the relationship of activity in these two brain structures to behavior in this plus maze. Um, but uh, over time, as, uh, as the, the lab progressed, we recognized that we needed to do better than correlation. We needed to, uh, as David put, test causality. And so uh, a couple of grad students in the lab, Tim Spellman and, um, and, and Nancy Padilla, set out to do exactly that in a couple of different ways.
the the first experiment was uh, done by Tim Spellman just to show that you could actually break information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex by injecting into the hippocampal cells a virus uh, causing the expression of enhanced ARCH 3.0 and inhibitory opsin. Uh, when you shine light upon the terminals of those uh, cells in the prefrontal cortex, here are the, is an image of the terminals in the prefrontal cortex shown in green. When you shine light on those terminals, Tim showed that you could actually uh, reduce synaptic transmission from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex substantially by a minimum of about uh, 30 or 40 percent. And uh, then Nancy went and shined the light on these cells with expression of the uh, opsin in its terminals and showed that if you do that, you take an animal that uh, is normally with the light off, spending only about 20 percent of its time in the open arm. And when you turn uh, on the light, when you decrease synaptic transmission from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, the animal then spends about half its time in the open arms. You turn the light back off again, it starts avoiding again, turn it on again, and it stops avoiding. And this doesn't occur in animals here in gray that are not expressing the opposite. So we have a reversible control over the avoidance behavior in these animals simply by shutting off or, or turning down information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. So uh, it does indeed seem like in, uh, uh, flow of information from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex is important for the avoidance behavior, but what about that, uh, that representation that we saw, that Abhishek saw when he looked at cells in the prefrontal cortex? Is, is that information flow important for the representation as well? So here's a representative uh, um, neuron. This neuron happens to fire in the predominantly in the closed arms of the maze, which in this image are uh, oriented vertically. Uh, and when you turn uh, down the synaptic information coming from the hippocampus of the prefrontal cortex, that structure breaks down. And you now have a neuron that tends to fire, for whatever reason, mostly in the upper right quadrant, uh, with some firing in the other arms as well. And you can uh, actually quantify the degree to which this neuron represents the openness versus closeness of the maze. We call this an EPM score. And what you can see is when you turn on the light, um, you, get, uh, you take these cells which have high EPM scores with the light off, uh, and they now have low EPM scores with the light on. And in fact, um, on average, if this is the average representation of the plus maze across some 50 or 100 neurons that uh, Nancy re uh, recorded with the light off, uh, you turn on the light and that information about openness versus closeness actually goes uh, to chance levels. So it does seem that the information, that, that whatever the hippocampus is sending to the prefrontal cortex, it is used to construct a map of the maze and that map is then uh, used to guide the behavior of the animal in the plus maze. Nancy had a lot of other data and I'll be too uh, had a lot of other data to support that notion that I'm happy to, to talk about as we move along, but I think uh, the, next, the next experiment really gets to the dynamics of the issue. So what I showed to you before is that hippocampal activity is going up and down and up and down uh, with, in, with these oscill various oscillatory patterns. We have fast oscillations, we have slow oscillations. And I showed you that the prefrontal cortical neurons that represent the openness versus closeness of the elevated plus maze are listening to the hippocampus or at least uh, seem to be listening to the hippocampus because they are phase locked to that slow, that eight hertz oscillation that's happening in the hippocampus. Now, uh, Nancy during her thesis defense, uh, not during thesis defense, during her thesis meeting was quite often asked, is that up and down, is that oscillation important? And it is also a, a question that I was asked uh, numerous times and um, kept on trying to avoid answering the question because I thought it would be a really challenging one to answer. But Nancy being fearless uh, decided that uh, she was gonna try to answer it. And so uh, to do so, she tried an experiment which I was convinced wouldn't work, um, but she did it anyway. She took channel road opsin. This is, of course, an excitatory opsin that stimulates the cells when you shine light on it and inject it into the hippocampus. And then uh, again, shine light on the terminals of those neurons in the prefrontal cortex. But rather than uh, doing the standard um, pulsed stimulation, um, she decided to give pattern stimulation in the prefrontal cortex. 
uh, and uh, the control actually was pulse stimulation. So typically when someone's trying to stimulate, say the amygdala to evoke uh, a fear-like behavior or really any other structure to evoke any other behavior, you pulse it with a very sharp square wave of light, which activates all the channel rhodopsin at once and gives you very, very nice action potentials in the cells that you're trying to uh, stimulate. And others have shown that it will evoke release, a very strong release from the terminals. So uh, that was the control condition. The, um, the, the experimental conditions for Nancy were frequent, different frequencies of oscillatory light. So the light would ramp up slowly and down slowly over time uh, with eight cycles, 20 cycles or, four, uh, or a second or four cycles a second. And uh, we'll get into the details a little bit later, I think, unless I cut that slide out in the interest of time. But suffice it to say that that does not induce action potentials in the cells because you essentially get asynchronous activation of channel rhodopsin. And what we found is actually what it did was enhance synaptic release on certain phases of the, of the cycle, um, as opposed to in the eight, like in the 8 hertz condition where it evokes uh, strong synchronous release. The reason why I'm telling you that in advance is because this was the hypothesis going in. The hypothesis going in was that if we just stimulated eight hertz pulses, we would be giving exogenous information to those medial prefrontal cortical neurons, and it wouldn't actually be able to help guide behavior in the maze in any meaningful way. But if we facilitated information flow, uh, with a natural rhythm that we might see changes in behavior that uh, that mimicked uh, increased avoidance. And indeed, that's what happened. So uh, let's show you the data for light off light. Uh, sorry, the structure of the experiment is simply um, give these different four different patterns of light, uh, two minutes off, two minutes on, just like when we tried to interrupt the neural transmission and measure the behavior of the animal as it's uh, exploring the maze. Um, uh, with the light off or with the patterns, uh, different patterns of light on. Uh, so that's what we did. We took different groups of animals and either, either gave them light uh, at eight hertz sine waves, eight hertz pulses, um, um, and, and uh, with and without the opsin. And what you can see is the sine waves drove down the percentage of time that the animal spent in the open arm or the number of entries that the animals made into the open arm, whereas the pulsed sine wave, the pulse uh, uh, um, light did not change uh, behavior and, and neither of those changes were seen unless the opsin was expressed. Uh, we also looked, I'm not showing you the four hertz, but we also looked at 20 hertz signs and uh, that really didn't change uh, behavior much at all in the veins. So it did indeed look like the dynamics of the system mattered and what we needed to do uh, was mimic the natural pattern of activity with uh, 8 hertz sine waves in order to affect an increase in avoidance behavior. So, so far things make sense, at least uh, superficially, that uh, if you inhibit information flow from the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, you decrease avoidance behavior, and if you stimulate it in a naturalistic way with these 8 hertz sine waves, you uh, um, increase the avoidance of the open arms instead. Um, but of course, the situation is not complex, is, is a little more complex than that. And the reason that I didn't, didn't think that this experiment would work is still the eight hertz sine wave is still unnatural. It's not like the, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, helping organize uh, uh, natural activity, or at least on the face of it. So we really wanted to understand what was going on. So remember, our first hypothesis was that eight hertz oscillations, uh, sorry, eight hertz um, square waves, eight hertz pulses would induce a train of activity that was tightly time locked to this exogenous rhythm, whereas eight hertz sine waves might facilitate information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. So we wanted to test that directly in the intact animal. And so uh, Nancy, with the help of some other students in the lab, was notably Tim, took an electrode and put a stimulating electrode and put it into the hippocampus and delivered electrical pulses to that stimulating electrode to evoke activity in hippocampal neurons. At the same time, she implanted the fiber optics into the medial prefrontal cortex to deliver light and record activity from the prefrontal cortical neurons at the same time. 
And uh, what you see when you uh, give a pulse of electricity here to the hippocampus, here uh, indicated by an arrow, in the medial prefrontal cortex is a modest increase in spike rate in the handful of milliseconds after that electrical activity. We've shown that before, others have shown it. The delay is about uh, 10 to 30 milliseconds, uh, which indicates the, 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 the monosynaptic delay plus potentially polysynaptic delay uh, that you get from hippocampus prefrontal cortex. Interestingly enough though, when Nancy turned on the eight hertz sine wave stimulation, she found an increase in the, uh, in the response of these uh, prefrontal cortical neurons to the ongoing hippocampal electrical stimulation. And she quantified that and found that eight hertz sine waves gave the biggest increase in, uh, in evoked activity. 20 hertz sine waves also increased the activity. Eight hertz pulses actually had no change in activity from the control here, which is the gray line. And that's shown here uh, for all across all the channel rhodopsin and not, not seen in the non-opsin animals, that eight hertz sine waves gives you a big increase in the evoked firing. Now, that was intriguing to me, and it did indeed suggest that our hypothesis is correct, that by giving this sine wave, we are enhancing information, uh, the ability of the hippocampal in, uh, inputs to drive the prefrontal uh, cortical cells. It was curious to me that 20 hertz sine waves didn't give as big an increase. One of the other things then we did is we, um, we did this same experiment. Um, uh, this, this is the data that, you, uh, basically the data that you saw before. Um, uh, sorry, I take it back. So, um, so this was done in an animal that was anesthetized and that was in a, um, a stereotax so that we could do the stimulation and do the recording. But we also wanted to know if we could see any of this uh, uh, any of the potentiation of these um, hippocampal inputs or of the light in the intact animal when it was navigating the mazes. And so uh, one proxy for this was to ask whether we saw in the prefrontal cortical neurons phase locking to the ongoing light oscillation. So not the hippocampus itself, but the actual optical signal that we put in. And indeed, when we put the animals into their familiar environment, and we stimulated the hippocampal inputs it, within the prefrontal cortex, the, the terminals in the prefrontal cortex with our eight hertz or 20 hertz sine wave, we saw phase locking to that optical stimulus. That is the prefrontal cortical neurons were more likely to fire uh, at, uh, at the peak of that optical stimulus as compared to the trough. But something curious happened when we took those same animals and put it into the elevated plus maze we saw a much larger potentiation to the eight hertz oscillation than we saw to the 20 hertz oscillation. So this was the first strong indication that something was different about the behavioral state, about, sorry, about the physiological state of these animals uh, in the elevated plus maze and their receptivity to inputs at different frequencies. So the eight hertz oscillation had a bigger effect when the animal was put in the plus maze, suggesting that there's something different about the state of the cortex in the plus maze that allowed it to preferentially receive this eight hertz input, which in this case, it's an exogenous input. In the natural uh, case without uh, optical stimulation, the eight hertz input is happens to be the input that is coming in, the frequency of the input that's coming in from the hippocampus. So um, this uh, it, uh, brings me to the end of the experimental story and um, I want to sort of tie all the data in together. So first, I showed you. Um, first, I showed you that the hippocampus uh, oscillates at a range of different frequencies, but most predominantly this eight hertz frequency, and that neurons within the prefrontal cortex that seem to be listening to that frequency represent the uh, structure of the plus maze that the animal uses to avoid uh, the open arms. We can interrupt that by shining light in an animal that has an, an inhibitory option in the hippocampal neurons. We can disrupt both the coding of behavior and the avoidance itself um, by blocking or decreasing the transmission from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. And we can enhance, we can enhance uh, um, avoidance of the plus maze by stimulating in such a way that we enhance synaptic flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. And that stimulation, it turns out, the dynamics matter. It has to be at eight times a second. And that, that has two components. 
uh, one of which um, I didn't show, but we showed you in vitro experiments that the synapse itself seems tuned for eight times a second. And the second seems to be this behavioral potentiation whereby the prefrontal cortex listens better to eight hertz than a faster frequency when the animal is actually placed in the plus maze. And I have some ideas about what that might be, um, but uh, I won't speculate on that just now. I can leave that to the Q&A. Now, all, lost in all of this, of course, is the fact that the information from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex is presumably what is being used to construct that map. And so uh, it was a surprise to me at all that we could get with this exogenous, even the sine wave stimuli, it was a surprise to me at all that we could potentiate actual information flow from the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why we think that's happening is because what I'm not showing here is that there is uh, uh, entrainment when we shine this channel, when we activate channel rhodopsin in the prefrontal cortex on the terminals, there's that becomes an over time and entrainment builds up in the hippocampus that was in Nancy's paper, but I don't really have time uh, to present that today. Although again, I'm happy to talk about that as well. So in reality, what we think is happening when we exogenously, exogenously stimulate is with, that we are synchronizing the entire circuit at this eight hertz rhythm. We can talk more about that later. But ideally what we would do is rather than simply impose an exogenous eight hertz oscillation showing that that potentiates information flow and avoidance, we'd like to be able to harness uh, the actual endogenous rhythms in the hippocampus and potentiate those. And that's what Maxim Miroshenko is doing now in, in the lab in, uh, at NIH. He's recording from the hippocampus uh, and stimulating in the prefrontal cortex, uh, filtering the hippocampal local field potential and applying that filtered eight hertz rhythm directly to the control of the laser. And through that, he can show that you can see a buildup of oscillations in the prefrontal cortex that are timed to the hippocampus uh, because uh, the laser is now synchronizing the entire structure to the ongoing endogenous rhythms within the hippocampus. Uh, and this is just an example of that shown in the spectrogram. Here is the uh, laser turned on at 10 hertz. Um, and over time in the prefrontal cortex, you can see the emergence of an oscillation that synchronizes with the so that's what we'd like to, to, to do next is use these closed loop stimulation procedures uh, to really uh, see how, how finely we can manipulate activity and information flow from the hippocampus of the follicle. So that concludes the experimental side of the talk. And now I wanna talk about uh, the policy side because of course in my job, that's mostly what I think about these days. Um, and um, Many of you know, we've been thinking a lot about the role of model organisms in biomedical research. And I think um, you can see today in the various talks you've heard a number of different approaches to using model organisms. And I think most of them share uh, what I think is our goal in, um, in moving forward animal, these model organisms. Uh, and that is we should use these model organisms as hypothesis tests rather than as uh, representative representations of illness per se. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, most of you are familiar, of course, with the various symptoms of major depressive disorder seen. Um, and how are we to go about using animal models to understand uh, major depressive disorder? Well, major depressive disorder has a collection of symptoms. And, uh, and so it's hard to imagine, uh, I think impossible, to imagine an animal model capturing the entirety of those collections. And I think, you know, most people don't think of it that way. Most people don't think of an animal model that's gonna ca uh, capture these various symptoms of major depressive disorder. There's a feature that's not on this symptom list, um, but that is that, uh, um, that major depressive disorder is a chronic relapsing remitting disorder, right? Which is even more challenging to imagine uh, modeling in an animal. Nonetheless, over the years, there have been animal models that have meant to mimic certain features of, of the disorders. For example, uh, the force swim test where you put an animal into an inescapable, uh, uh, inescapable beaker of, of water or milk or whatever other liquid you have. And it's meant to model certain aspects of major depressive disorder, specifically um, uh, changes in uh, uh, increased despair uh, and or psychomotor slowing. And the, um, the, 
the test has been used to some extent fruitfully, to some extent uh, sending us down a lot of wormholes that haven't worked out to, for example, discover drugs which might work as antidepressants. And a number of antidepressants um, actually reduce uh, the amount of time spent immobile in this task, which is the classic readout. Typically, these kinds of tests have been judged based upon um, what one might call validity. And those of you who've um, uh, those of you who've taken coursework in animal models of disease are familiar with the term validity. And there are you know, many different forms of validity. I'll discuss three principal forms. There's face validity, uh, which captures some uh, outward aspects of the symptoms of a disorder. In this case, um, for example, we might uh, try to model the symptoms of psychomotor slowing, a loss of energy, uh, or, uh, or, or despair uh, as a concept. Uh, although that gets into the construct the validity piece. Um, there are is predictive validity, and that's the, this last piece that I mentioned that the, the tests might predict pharmacological responses. So for example, monoaminergic antidepressants, uh, which do help treat and, uh, depression in, in many human beings, also uh, reduce uh, the uh, so-called depression-like behaviors in the four swim test. And then there's construct validity, that is the the test utilizes or uh, harnesses the same theoretical uh, or neurobiological system engaged in the disorder. In this case, this, this test of for swim is meant to, um, to evoke behavioral despair, which is a, uh, a, a, a theoretical construct for some of the activity that we see in individuals' depression. The problem with this discussion of validity is it presupposes that the mechanisms that are engaged in human beings uh, that either underlie face or predictive or construct validity in the animals are, uh, are the same in the animals. And unfortunately, what's shown time and time again is that it's all too often not the, the case that that's not true. Uh, the, the, in fact, tests like the four swim, which have been most strongly touted as predictively valid for depression, have long been known to fail even that uh, predictive validity test. So for example, this paper uh, from uh, 1979 uh, argued that, um, that the four swim test uh, failed as a predictively valid test of depression, although imipramine, a known antidepressant, does decrease the duration of, duration of immobility. So do other drugs such as caffeine, pentobarbital, uh, that have no antidep known antidepressant uh, effects in human beings. And so um, we lose, uh, uh, it fails the test of validity for specificity, and that's been shown actually over and over again since, in that although it is true that many antidepressants do uh, decrease immobility in the test, there are many, many more drugs which alter immobility in the task, but which don't have utility as depression, as antidepressants. Um, the predictive validity is further worsened by the fact that um, in the strain of mouse, for example, matters tremendously as to whether one even sees the effects of antidepressants. Uh, and uh, uh, any one antidepressant might work well in one strain and not in another in terms of uh, having a, quote, antidepressant-like effect in the force one test. So that's cautionary tale number one of using validity as a measure to, uh, to approximate, to, to, to justify the development of animal models. Cautionary tale number two is uh, using, to try to use behavioral phenotypes, uh, whether they be from a face validity or predictive validity or construct validity perspective to validate genomic models of human disease. Um, many of you are familiar with the use of uh, the, the discovery of DISC-1, which was a gene that was shown to be found in a family uh, of individuals who had a number of different psychiatric syndromes associated with that uh, translocation, including schizophrenia, but also including a number of other psychiatric disorders. Um, there were a number of papers in which animal models of that translocation, uh, and particularly deletion of the DISC-1 gene itself, uh, or missense mutations, showed behavioral phenotypes that, uh, such as working memory deficits that were reminiscent of schizophrenia and used to justify that model as a model uh, of schizophrenia per se. And uh, what's been shown over time since is number one, that DISC-1 is actually not genetically associated with uh, schizophrenia. Uh, 
And number two, that um, these behavior, uh, in a number of other models, these behavioral methods of validating those connections uh, turn out to, uh, to not uh, be all that useful. And, um, and again, for many reasons to do with specificity and sensitivity. At leading a group of individuals who formed an advisory uh, a work group to NIMH uh, to um, uh, assert that despite the utility importance of mice and other animals in follow-up studies intended to illuminate components of disease pathological mechanisms, genetically engineered animals should no longer be interpreted as veridical models of psychiatric disorder pathogenesis or pathophysiology. So uh, the importance of this sentence might be a little bit overstated in the sense that we do think genetically engineered models can be very, very useful to test hypotheses of relevance to the pathogenesis and pathophysiology. But assuming that just because you take a bona fide uh, gene, which is relevant for psychiatric disorders and disrupt it in an animal and then study the downstream effects of that gene, that those are going to be representative of the pathophysiology that we see in human beings uh, that assumption uh, doesn't often work. So how do we use or test the relevance of these animal models? And what we're really moving towards at NIMH is moving away from validity, away from the concept that, mo that these animal models are models of disorders, um, moving away from tests that ask how well the model represents the disorder, and in particular uh, uh, represents DSM-like disorders, towards models of utility. That is, models that might help us understand aspects of disorders. And in particular, the question that we ask of grants that are being uh, considered for funding oops, uh, is how well the model addresses the question of interest. And this tends to be an RDOC-like issue because we're no longer considering of trying to figure out whether it's a model of schizophrenia, but rather how can the model be used to understand the neurobiology, for example, of working memory uh, and the neuro and or the neurobiology of biomarkers, for example, such as those discussed by David Lewis earlier. And from that utility approach, we urge our investigators to ask themselves, and we often ask these questions when they are trying to figure out what model to use and how to use it. Uh, number one, what is the question you want to ask? And is that question an impactful one for understanding mental illness and developing novel approaches to treatment? Number two, will the study that you're proposing and the animal model that you're trying to use, will that study answer the question that you're trying to ask? Um, and importantly, is the model that you've picked the right one to answer the question? And that's, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis some questions that were asked earlier about, uh, for example, non-human primate models. Is it an efficient and ethical use of resources? Is it feasible? And is there evidence for evolutionary conservation of mechanisms? So these are the kinds of questions that we ask when we evaluate animal model studies, rather than um, is there face validity, is there predictive validity, uh, is there construct validity. And uh, I've put these uh, thoughts in writing so that you don't have to trust my word for it. You can, you can read them. We've also put it into a, an official a notice that sets out the guidelines for use of animal approaches, in particular animal neural behavioral approaches, and, we, and I hope you use those as you're considering what kinds of models and how to use them and moving forward. We also have, uh, in relevance to several of the talks today, but most notably Tracy's, um, a, a statement both in the journals as well as in a notice that, uh, that discusses our priorities in stress biology. And let me just say that you know, Tracy's, uh, Tracy's work that she discussed is just a superb example of the kind of integration of various approaches that we think is gonna be really important for understanding stress. And importantly, I think from that perspective, Tracy's talk started with humans uh, and all of the data that she showed was meant to be interpreted in the context of what we know from humans. And I think that's really important, both for stress biology and for uh, biology in humans and uh, uh, biology moving forward. And I think, I think I probably have time for this. One of the things that's a little bit less, uh, that we're still working on um, figuring out ways to communicate is that we think computational modeling, particularly computational modeling of behavior, can play a really strong, important role in developing the hypotheses that you hope to test with animal models and in enabling the uh, translation of those models. And just one example, which uh, many may be familiar with, but I thought it's well elucidated by this paper by Alex Kwan and a colleague uh, 
uh, in chronic stress, uh, which uh, details uh, the approach of applying reinforcement learning to rodent stress research. Of course, stress biology affects many aspects of behavior, but one of the most salient ones is the uh, 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 the effects on uh, on reward uh, uh, learning, reward seeking, uh, and reward learning in particular can be quantified with uh, by applying reinforcement learning models, which uh, which enable the calculation, the exact calculation of specific learning parameters that can then uh, be tested to see how stress alters those learning parameters, and that can be done in. Uh, even though, though the behaviors and the rewards might be different from animals to human beings, the, the reinforcement learning model is applicable to both humans and animals. And the parameters that you calculate from that model can be translated directly from humans to animals. So the idea is that you can take uh, the underlying biology, map it onto these learning parameters, and test that across species. And I think uh, Reinforcement learning is not the only model that I think will be useful in terms of computationally modeling behavior and applying neurobiological approaches in both humans and animals to understand that behavior. So finally, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we have NIMH funding opportunities and announcements that are um, specifically geared to help people make the move to uh, these kinds of approaches in model organisms, including uh, calls for uh, more computationally defined behaviors in psychiatry, um, support for people to build in vivo preclinical assays of circuit engagement um, that might be used to develop therapeutics, but that are focused more on hypothesis testing than they are on uh, building models of illness per se, uh, as well as novel assays to address translational gaps in treatment development. Um, again, based on the notion that we want to move from neurobiology uh, in models to treatment targets in human beings. And with that, I'll put up the vision and mission. And I, I actually, I want to thank the people who did the work. I mentioned several graduate students, Tim Spellman, who is now a postdoc at, uh, at Cornell, Avishek Adhikari, who just started his own lab actually a few years ago at UCLA, uh, and Nancy Padilla, who uh, is about to start a new faculty position. Uh, I think she's made her final decision, but I'm not sure she's announced it to the world. Um, and then uh, the new lab at uh, NIH, which includes, I mentioned, Max, Maxim uh, um, uh, Miroshnichenko, I'm sure I butchered that earlier. Um, who's been doing the closed loop stimulation. And I should also give a shout out to Dave uh, Kupfer Schmidt, who actually runs the lab day to day for me at NIH. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. That was uh, just a wonderful presentation. And uh, Claire will now begin to uh, lead us off in questions. Uh, I will. Thank you so much for that talk. That was really cool to hear all of the papers that we've read all semester come together. Um, the, the questions that we came up with as a group are much more focused on the, the policy side. Um, so the, the first question is about how we, we model and conceptualize disease and disorder um, in psychiatry and how that intersects with health disparities. Um, mm -hmm. So the first question is, um, inequities and disparities and exposure to stress-inducing environments can result in responses or symptoms that are sometimes labeled pathological when they may be more accurately characterized as adaptations to a difficult environment. How might that shift in understanding uh, of the basis of psychopathology be used to potentially reduce inequities in who participates and who benefits from um, this kind of research. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. It's a great question. Let me start with the first half. And Claire, tell me if I don't get to the second half, because I tend to wander off a little bit like David's patient. Um, so first, first and foremost, I think in the, the big missing thing in stress biology, in particular in translating what we know from animals into humans, is understanding what's adaptive versus maladaptive responses to stress. And I see you nodding. I see Ned nodding. I'm not a stress biologist per se, but that, that, that strikes me. We know a lot about 
the complexity of the stress response in humans. We know a lot about the complexity response, stress response in animals. But because we lack uh, the tools to do proper C uh, causal studies in human beings, it's hard to know which of those actually help people respond better to stress and become more resilient versus which of those uh, cause maladaptive responses that aren't helpful down the road. And Claire, you've hit upon with the discussion of how that intersects with, um, you know, with health disparities is that what's maladaptive for one population may be quite adaptive for another population, right? Um, and so uh, that those are all great questions, which I don't think we've really been able to unpack that well. And one of the reasons I think we haven't been able to unpack it that well is because we, we've been stuck in this, uh, not stuck, but we've been predominantly thinking about it from that disorder frame of mind. One of the observations that I remember learning about way back as a resident was the observation that, you know, from, I think it was mostly from vets, right, by Dennis Charney and others, that the people who've been through a stressful experience and gained mastery over it with a sense of self-efficacy are actually better prepared and less likely to get PTSD when they're stress exposed later on. So presumably some of that has to do with the epigenetics of, of stress exposure that Tracy talked about, right? So uh, presumably the body wouldn't do all this in response to stress if it wasn't somehow uh, actually uh, 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 adaptive. Of course, it might be adaptive for one environment uh, or adaptive evolutionarily, whereas it's not so adaptive in other environments or in the current, uh, in the modern world. So I think uh, understanding that is, is really uh, challenging. Now, how do, we, how do we turn that and help figure out a way to make sure that, you know, our research is beneficial for all Americans and not just uh, majority populations or, uh, or, um, uh, or populations that are already well resourced. And I think under, understanding that complexity, understanding the difference between, uh, understanding what's adaptive and maladaptive in human beings in different contexts is gonna be really, really important. And, uh, and you know, Tracy talked a lot about community engagement uh, that she's engaged with. We heard about, you know, the Grady Project down, uh, that's been taking place for a long time in Atlanta and other, um, other examples of, uh, of, of ways to ensure that we do a good job recruiting uh, uh, individuals to participate in research. Uh, I think uh, you've there th those folks are better uh, uh, able to tell you what it takes to be able to do that. But I think conceptualizing the responses to stress as, as adaptive and maladaptive and understanding strengths as well as weaknesses is definitely an important step along the way. Okay, thank you so much. Um, our second question is um, based on uh, a quote that we talked about a lot in class. Um, in a recent interview, the former director of the NIMH, uh, your predecessor, stated that he did not think that his focus on neuroscience and genetics had really moved the needle in reducing suicides, reducing hospitalizations, and improving recovery for people with mental illness over his 13-year term. And we wondered as a class if this observation stemmed in part from a disconnect between molecular neuroscience and other levels of analysis. Because when uh, psychologists and therapists work with patients, the molecular and genetic mechanisms often are not informing their treatment decisions. And even most of the tools that psychiatrists use were not developed based on a molecular neuroscience understanding of disorders. So we wanted to ask, do you agree that a better integration of molecular levels of analysis with systems neuroscience or a behavioral level of analysis would accelerate the translation of the molecular discoveries? Uh, and if so, in your opinion, what would be the most important next steps to incentivize or improve integration across those levels of analysis? Yeah, well, you mentioned the, probably the least favorite quote of my predecessor. I know Tom well, I like him well, and uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, that quote is a little bit of sour grapes and, uh, and also a, a little bit of a lack of understanding, I think, of the, the time frame involved. I think when he took over his job, he made a prediction that in 10 years he was going to be able to do something with this neurobiology. And I think uh, I, there's no way in hell I'd make a prediction like that um, because of the time frame involved. Um, number one. Number two, it's a little premature because actually in 2019 and now it looks like in 2020, we now had two consecutive years of decreases in suicides in the United States of America. But I, I agree that it had nothing to do with neurobiology. What it had to do was uh, implementation of 
um, screening methods in primary care and emergency rooms and uh, greater awareness and greater uptake of crisis intervention services. But that's not what you're asking me about. But I think the the, 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 the near-term gains in mental health are not made from neurobiology. Near-term gains in mental health are made from uh, investments in um, treatments that we have that we know work in getting to the people that need it and getting them uh, to populations that are underserved. That said, how do we make neurobiology, how do we help neurobiology translate into better treatments? And we have uh, I used to say zero, but I think now we have at least one and possibly two FDA approved medications that were actually developed with a neurobiologic approach. And, uh, and, and the two being uh, uh, um, um, uh, brexanolone and potentially esketamine. But there's, you know, you could argue that that was luck too. But what, but I think, you know, you've hit on a, an important component of it. And you can take, you know, David's talk today as as trying to do this to a certain extent we actually have better systems tools in human beings than we have molecular tools at least as far as the brain is concerned right we can record eeg we can record mri and although from my you know single unit electrophysiological perspective those are incredibly crude tools they actually give you biomarkers that you can begin to make some inferences about what's happening at the circuit level. But of course, most of our tools now, at least in psychiatry are molecular tools. They're drugs that activate specific receptors or specific second messenger systems or whatever. So trying to reduce these complex systems level phenotypes down to understand um, what the molecular machinery is that gives rise to them is one approach that I think has the promise to translate. Um, is brexanolone that? It might be. Brexanolone is a essentially a hormone that we have normally, and um, understanding its role in behavior and it, at the system level in reproduction led to the understanding that it might play a role in postpartum depression. And then uh, understanding the molecular basis of that hormone, what chemical it is, and being able to recreate it allowed us to uh, develop that, that as a drug. Um, but I think what you're really talking about is making the link between levels that are manipulable with drugs and levels that are uh, that are observable in human beings in the brain. And so I think that's one pathway forward. It's probably the most near term pathway forward in neurobiology. And I've spoken and written about this before. We're now at the level where we have good circuit level tools to understand, like some of which I showed you today, uh, others, uh, you know, Tom Cash showed that allow us to break down these complex systems level phenomenon and behavior level phenomenon into specific neural projections and even specific neural subtypes and maybe even specific 10 or 20 or 50 neurons. Um, but most of us in circuit neuroscience haven't gone that extra level to then incorporate the molecular modeling into, into it. So for example, what are the molecules on the surface of those hippocampal terminals in the prefrontal cortex or on the prefrontal cortical neurons themselves that allow or that, that that specify the eight hertz oscillation as a good transmission frequency? Are there ion channels that make it? And then one can imagine manipulating those molecules to be able to alter communication at that frequency. And we aren't there yet when that's a place we need to go. The brain initiative is well set up to take us there because the brain initiative is trying to catalog, catalog all the cell types that we in the circuit science can then assign function to, but also their molecular constituency. What are the proteomics and transcriptomics that are engaged in those specific cell types that will give us some clues to be able to understand how to unlock that translation from molecules to circuits. I should mention also that there is hope that we might be able to refine our non-pharmacologic treatments uh, and here I'm thinking mostly about brain stimulation treatments, but perhaps also psychological treatments to be able to engage the circuit directly and not need that molecular understanding, but I don't think we're there yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then our final question uh, was uh, addressed a little bit at the beginning of uh, Dr. Bale's talk that COVID-19 uh, has different disproportionately affected racial minorities in the U.S. and uh, studies published earlier this year have suggested that individuals who survive COVID-19 may be at an increased risk for psychopathology. 
Um, improving mental health care delivery and reducing health disparities is an important part of the NIMH five-year strategic plan, given the potential for increases in mental and physical health disparities in the aftermath of COVID-19. Um, how can NIMH support policy changes to prevent these disparities across racial groups from increasing? Yeah, so um, that's a policy question as opposed to a science policy question. That's a true healthcare policy question. I think, um, you know, we try to bring to bear the evidence base for expanded access for healthcare and delivery of healthcare in acceptable ways to minority communities. And I think that's um, a big part of decreasing health disparities in general. Um, so NIMH funded research has shown, for example, that Hispanic communities uh, are much more likely to accept mental health care for their kids if it's delivered through schools. Um, that African-American communities um, can uh, actually uh, are, are perfectly willing to accept health care, mental health care, but the health care providers are often not there um, and are often, as you might imagine, not, not black and perceived as outsiders. And so increasing the supply of local uh, healthcare practitioners and increasing the diversity of workforce is is key to that. Some of those are longer term solutions than others. So to a certain extent, we have an evidence base to support interventions that will decrease health disparities. But I have to admit that that evidence base is not as rich as we would like, and we need to do more research in that area. Specifically with regard to COVID-19, we actually have a number of research programs we're supporting that may help um, even in the short term, develop uh, approaches that might mitigate those health disparities. So we, along with several other institutes, uh, are running uh, and funding a, a, a substantial effort to study the behavioral impacts, as well as the social and economic impacts of the COVID pandemic, particularly and especially in minority communities. There's some 50 grants that have been supplemented for that, and we're awarding this year, hopefully 10 to 15 uh, new grants uh, to study the uh, mental health and other impacts of the pandemic in these minority communities. And that may give us answers, even the supplements in the short term, because they're essentially uh, testing efforts to understand and mitigate those, um, those impacts in minority communities, even as we speak. The, um, the uh, yeah, that, so, so I'd say NIMH, I, I should say, is also uh, funding a number of studies that are in particular targeting the issue of disparities. Um, one, one interesting approach that I think is, is, is important is uh, to think about is the impact of the shift to telehealth that took place during the COVID pandemic. Uh, the data that we have so far suggests that it, it may actually have worked to at least preserve and perhaps expand access to behavioral health care in the context of the pandemic. For example, data from uh, federally qualified health centers in Southern California show an actual increase in the total number of behavioral health care visits to these uh, centers. These are centers that provide mental health care to people who are underinsured or uninsured. Um, and uh, and the, the total number of visits increased even though the in-person visits plummeted. And that's because um, uh, telehealth visits dramatically increased in the context of the pandemic. The um, Another interesting thing, though, from that study was showing that most of those visits were audio only, not uh, not Zoom or or or, or, or other visual uh, methods of approaches, as opposed to uh, in a different study by the Kaiser uh, uh, Research Foundation, which uh, conducts research in their own healthcare systems. So these are insured or uh, Medicare or Medicaid patients, whereas many more of them used uh, video based telehealth options. So. There's a lot to learn yet here about how to deliver appropriate mental health care in the context of, uh, of minority communities. Fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that work. Um, I think, Richard, you're muted. That. No worries. Uh, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, we have time maybe for one question from the audience, but then we'll all reconvene together so there'll be more opportunity. Um, I'm going to just read one question. Leah asks, what advice do you have for people looking to leverage patient slash participant expertise when designing behavioral models? 
That's a really good question. Um, one thing to think about is the problem you're trying to solve, right? So, for example, in the autism community, higher functioning individuals with autism are much less concerned about their social dis you know, their social, di their differences in social behaviors than they are in their ability to, um, uh, to be accepted by others. And um, it's less about their um, understanding of others and more about their under others understanding of them. Lower functioning individuals with autism, typically what you don't hear from them, you hear from their parents and their parents are concerned Again, less about social functioning for their low for their for their uh, kids who are suffering from you know severe cognitive disabilities, and they're really really concerned about violence and agitation, because these kids can do real harm to themselves and others. So there are two different examples of where talking to two different people might steer you in two different directions for what kinds of issues are important to try to work out with models. So if you're talking to the parents of severely disabled neuro, you know, uh, children with neurodevelopmental disorders and autism, um, they might cause you to say, you know what, I'm going to take that shank three animal and I'm going to look at their, uh, the, the hypothalamus and their connections to prefrontal cortical regions in the regulation of aggressive behavior or of self-harm behavior to try to figure out whether we might be able to develop a treatment that would help children with autism be less uh, aggressive and less violent. So those are the kinds of things that you might, uh, I, I think that, that might really help is trying to figure out what problems to work on, what problems are really impactful. That's great, very helpful, thank you. Uh, so we're gonna take a um, short break now and we will reconvene at 3.30 central time, uh, 4.30 eastern time for uh, uh, a discussion among all the speakers today. So we really appreciate your joining us, Josh, and it was a fantastic illuminating talk. We really appreciate it. All right. Yes, Josh, thanks, thanks much.